House. I guess the team's going yeah. to the White House in June, so you'll soon have a visit to the White House. Uh, Tom has been president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City for the past seven years. He was previously the executive vice president and CEO, the same organization. He has 31 years of healthcare management experience. And you've got his long intro, which I'm not going to read through, but uh, he was honored last September with the William F. Yates Medallion for Distinguished Service, and this is the highest honor given by, non-academic honor given by William Jewell College. And uh, it was bestowed on him, as I said, last September. Mr. Bowser's talk today is on leadership tips and the health of Kansas City uh, and the nation. It's a pleasure to introduce Mr. Bowser. Uh, thank you, Bob. It's nice to be with you. Lots of uh, familiar faces in this audience. I have the great privilege of working with many of you through the year. Uh, Barb Atkinson, Dave, uh, Ed, uh, to name just a few, are the folks that uh, I'm privileged to work with as we at Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, labor to help individuals and business finance health care for 900,000 of our customers. And uh, it is an ever-growing challenge. Uh, as I look at how you have chosen your seats here in this uh, beautiful auditorium, it reminds me of how the hospitals are uh, allocating themselves throughout the metropolitan area. The central city is open, the suburbs are full, and uh, I think it's a, a trend happening in lots of places. I have a, a number of ties to, to KU, uh, in addition to my wife and I being KU graduates. Our son, Chris, uh, is a uh, KU Med School graduate and now is a practicing emergency medicine physician in the St. Luke's Hospital System. My daughter, Beth, is a nurse, a labor and delivery nurse in Tulsa, received uh, a lot of her training although she, here at KU, even though she didn't graduate from here. My son's wife uh, is Lisa Hofer Bowser. She is a graduate of the KU Physical Therapy School. And, uh, Although the health news is sad, uh, the treatment is good for my wife at the new KU Breast Center on Shawnee Mission Parkway. I've told uh, Barbara and Bob Page and anyone else who will listen how impressive that facility is in treating uh, uh, a disease that I think has become epidemic in its proportions. And uh, you are all doing a fine job there, and I commend you uh, for that. My objective today is to describe how you as individuals uh, can demonstrate your leadership in the healthcare uh, workplace. And I'm going to do it hopefully uh, in, in a manner that's memorable and uh, light, but uh, it is a challenge because we face many, many obstacles, whether you're a teacher, whether you're delivering direct care to patients, or uh, doing something else that's uh, related to this huge industry we call the American healthcare system. Uh, my wisdom in all of this comes from working with doctors and hospitals like those here at KU uh, in serving our uh, customers and figuring out what services should be paid for, uh, those that we might need to wait on for a while. Uh, I'm proud that our company, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, uh, covers 42% of the market share here in Kansas City. Uh, in addition to the 900,000 customers we have in Kansas City, we're celebrating a milestone of covering 100 million Americans nationwide in the Blue Cross Blue Shield system. One in three uh, carry our ID card, and since we do serve the university, I'm hoping that most of you have that Blue Cross and Blue Shield card in your pocket or purse today. First piece of advice, I'm going to begin with some practical advice that's worked for me that will hopefully work for you. Um, my wife has a great habit of jotting down notes to people who have admirable traits or who have done something special. Uh, she's a music teacher and whether it's a, a good deed, uh, an expression of music talent or, or, or a difficult job well done, my wife Judy always writes a note off to, every, to, to someone. And, I think that's a good habit that you as leaders ought to think about doing if you're not doing it already. A few years ago uh, on this theme, I told her how much I admired a guy who cries on television. And she said, well, have you written him a note? How's he supposed to know that you admire him? And by the way, who is it? I said, well, it's Roy Williams. She said, well, don't write a note then. <laughs> 
maybe she's forgiven Roy after the great victory in San Antonio, but I'm not sure. My second piece of advice is pick and emulate a role model. When you look at the people that uh, you work with or others that you come in contact with, uh, I think it's important to uh, pick a few who you admire and as you look up upon your leadership model, try to emulate those traits that you find admirable and effective in others. Don't look for perfection. Uh, you're probably not perfect and every role model is not going to be perfect, but you can look at someone and say, I like the way he or she does this or that. That's proven to be a very effective way for me uh, to add leadership traits as, uh, as my career has unfolded. I want to share three of the role models in my life. For a period of time, uh, 87 through 95, I worked at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma in Tulsa. Uh, the Methodist minister there was, uh, and still is, uh, Reverend Muzon Biggs. He was the senior pastor at uh, Boston Avenue Methodist Church. And he says, good leaders must maintain a balance in their personal and professional life. You can't be a good husband or a good father if you become obsessed with work. The workaholic tends to burn out over time, thus losing their value to the one that they are loving the most, their employer. By being balanced in our lifetime passions, we can, in fact, be good in all of our responsibilities. Dr. Biggs has a sage message also to caution about what we hold out as the most important things in our lives. Uh, for example, he once banned the plane of the eyes of Texas are upon you at the funeral of a very prominent church member. The widow said to him, but the University of Texas was the most important thing in his life. Dr. Biggs said, what a shame. Another role model that I hold out is my uncle, Dan Henry, retired weatherman from Channel 4. Some of you may remember him. He's been retired about 11 years. His last name is Bowser. They told him early on, uh, uh, that's not going to cut it in broadcasting, buddy. What's your middle name? Henry. You're Dan Henry. And he has been an inspiration to me throughout my life. And I like to say he, uh, his favorite phrase is sunshine to you. And he brings it wherever he goes. Another role model for me is Roy Williams. Uh, the KU North Carolina basketball coach is a classy and inspirational guy. I think uh, he shows positive traits whether he's winning or losing. And to this day, I feel guilty that I never sent that note that I intended to. Maybe now is a good time to do that. Here's another tip about leadership I'd like to share with you uh, on performance appraisals. I advise you to give a performance appraisal as if you were receiving it yourself. Everyone hates performance appraisals, whether you're giving it or whether you're receiving it. Uh, and I advise you to appraise the work of others as though you uh, uh, were receiving it yourself, as I said earlier. But you also have to understand in that mix that there is work to be done and both the supervisor and the individual have to acknowledge that that's what you're here for. Uh, but I think so many times an appraisal is uh, crushing on someone in terms of their self-esteem upon how they are viewed in the workplace and we can do a much better job of that in medicine, in business, and in life in general. Another thing I would like to do is uh, encourage you to be constructive in your coaching of others. I encourage you to make up your own mind about people and don't take uh, the word of other people uh, uh, too much, uh, put too much stock on it. Uh, instead, figure out for yourself what the strengths and weaknesses are of an individual. I like to say Cliff Notes and Facebook books are for college, not the workplace. Inspire the individual to do more to improve by genuinely complimenting their strengths and encouraging them to work on their shortcomings. I consider it the golden rule. It works in the home and it works in the American workplace. Another tip for you is show that you care. Whether you are the dean of your school or the newest employee in a small department, it pays big, di big dividends to honestly care about others. And what, from what I've seen about this place, that is a trait that is in ample evidence. 
A good place to start is to learn people's name and use those names when you see them. Another way is to show that you value the people you supervise is to care about them. If you want sympathy as an individual or as a supervisor, if you want understanding, and if you want support from your fellow workers, give it to them first. A next, uh, the next trait that I think is important is to be patient. I love that monster.com ad that you may have seen with the bewildered executive sitting in a boardroom full of monkeys. You know the feeling, you've had it yourself, and it kind of goes like this. What am I doing in this place? Why am I surrounded by morons? Where is the headhunter when I need him? You all have felt that way, I suspect, and so have I. Here's my advice. Don't call monster.com every time you have a depressing day at the hospital. The grass is not always greener at another hospital or at another department. In fact, studies show that over two-thirds of your career will be spent under a boss who is less than ideal. Try not to be one of them. And remember that your employer won't always reward you when you do good deeds or you deserve the reward. However, over a lifetime, a devotion to your career and to health care can produce bounty beyond measure. Next piece of advice is be humble. Be big enough to laugh at yourself when circumstances make you look like an idiot. And in a big, complex environment like you work in, that's going to happen, believe me. And it'll probably happen more than once. I think life is too serious and too short to treat it any other way. Let me illustrate with uh, a personal example. Uh, the year was 1989. I was working at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma then. And um, I had just closed a big deal, a uh, business deal, by convincing the uh, HMO program at Oral Roberts University School of uh, Medicine there to merge with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma's HMO program. And I did it without paying them a dime. And I'm saying to myself, what a wizard I am to pull this deal off. There were skeptics. They were physicians, as you might imagine. And in order to close the deal, I invited all the medical staff from the Oral Roberts Medical School to come across the street to a hotel, and we were going to demonstrate that we were regular people, not big, bad business people, and uh, we would treat them in a fair and respectful way. I was laying it on thick, let me tell you. I was giving a speech kind of like this, and I was at the same time looking for the arrival of the biggest and most respected uh, physician leader, uh, Dr. Calvert, a uh, thoracic uh, surgeon. And uh, so this guy appears in the doorway up here and he's got a white jacket on and I start making comments and nods toward uh, Dr. Calvert and telling him how much I appreciated having him and his colleagues in the room and how well we were going to treat them. Then I sat down and the guy I thought was Dr. Calvert came over and leaned over my shoulder and said, sir, can I take your salad plate now? That kind of stuff happens. They laughed at me. The deal got done. Everything worked out uh, well. Next, the soft sell sometimes works best. Pounding the desk with your fist is not a, a winning leadership trait. It doesn't very, work very well at home, and it doesn't work very well at the hospital. Uh, try not to use the same tone of instruction for your employees that you may have used on non-compliant patients. I recommend two spoons of compassion for every spoon of instruction. The next uh, piece of advice is uh, a little, little bit more challenging for all of us. And I, what I want to do is talk about this raging battle between the world of science and the world of faith and the battles that ensue around things like stem cell research and the other kinds of research that, are being, uh, uh, that is being conducted here and across the nation. Uh, Well-meaning people from different spectrums come together and enemies are created and progress is stopped. And uh, it's, it's my belief that one prescription to help with all of that is to be more tolerant and more respectful of others and don't uh, try to act like uh, 
any one point of view is the only point of view on these issues. With regard to the debate on stem cell research and other kinds of research, uh, I, I, I want to say to you, I know it's not easy to be a good leadership when you're in the crossfire of these different points of view from the world of faith and the world of science. We had a speaker, a, a physician, uh, by the name of Daniel Foster, MD, from Dallas. Uh, he is an internal medicine specialist. Come talk to us at the Civic Council about a year ago. He had some wonderful insight a topic that, I, that I'd like to share with you. He said, the relationship between science and faith is a lively subject in the United States. An antagonistic encounter is on center stage with a primary focus on stem cell research and the teaching of evolution in public schools. In these areas, faith is seen by science as an enemy and vice versa. Scientific progress has been truly exhilarating, but as a byproduct, many scientists have come to believe that no creator was needed. In a poll of members of the National Academy of Science in 1998, 7% of its members had a personal belief in God, 72% a personal disbelief, and 21% had no doubt or had doubt or agnosticism. I'm not going off on a, on a preacher tangent here. I'm trying to uh, talk to you about something that we all deal with day in and day out. Um, Dr. Foster goes on to quote Sir Isaiah Berlin, an Oxford scholar, who said, few things have done more harm than the belief on the part of individuals or groups or tribes or states or nations or churches that they are in the sole possession of truth. And those who differ from them are not nearly mistaken, but are wicked or mad or needing restraint or suppressing. It is a terrible and dangerous arrogance to believe that you alone are right. Dr. Foster gives us all these suggestions in leadership. We should accept that scientists and others unable to believe are not bad people. We should acknowledge and rejoice in the findings of modern medicine. He said, I believe great scientific discoveries are revelations from God, even if the scientist doesn't know it. Point three, we should focus on the core truths of faith, not minor things. We believe that God created heaven and earth, not care that it didn't occur in six days. As the longtime president of Notre Dame said, the Reverend, it was the Reverend Theodore uh, uh, Hesborough, uh, at, he, he made a speech at the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, uh, his opening line was, uh, scientists, uh, give me the beginning, you can have the rest. I thought that was a pretty good observation on it all. I'd like to move now to talk about leadership uh, that is required of me and you in the American health care issues uh, facing our nations. Um, I've prepared four questions I'm going to pose to you and uh, ask you to raise your hand. It's kind of a true or false. If you're uncomfortable raising your hand, that's okay. There's not a right answer or a wrong answer, but I think it's a very good way of, of highlighting some of the issues uh, being debated by our presidential candidates and which will be debated by them in our House and Senate in, uh, in the months and years to come. Question number one. Health care is a right. Every American should have health care regardless of their ability to pay. For those who believe this to be a true statement, hold your hand up. Okay. Who, those who believe it to be false, hold your hand up. Okay. Here's my take on the issue, and, and I, I don't claim to be uh, absolutely right on this, but it's my observation from a humanitarian standpoint. Most Americans feel access to high-quality health care should be a right. From an economic standpoint, our nation has yet to find an equitable way to fund health insurance for every American. Dicey issues for the political debate include, should employers be required to provide insurance? What, we do, what, what are we supposed to do with employers who can't afford to provide health insurance? Should we have Medicare for everyone? Should we pay the tax to provide health insurance for those who can't afford it? Those are some of the debates that uh, are uh, happening today and I, I think will continue. Question number two, everyone should be, quote, mandated 
to have health insurance, just like car insurance. State and federal dollars should be used to subsidize premiums for the poor. For those who believe that to be true, hold your hand. Okay. Those who aren't so sure of that, okay. That's a debate that's occurring. You know the uh, health care reform in the state of Man uh, Massachusetts requires people to have health insurance. They've gone from having 700,000 people uninsured to about 300,000 now. It's my personal belief that unless people have some requirement to purchase health insurance, uh, they may use that money, which is substantial, for something else. Uh, maybe that's their right, maybe it's not, uh, but the burden of providing uh, care to the uninsured is a huge financial burden for this hospital, for this medical school, and for our community and our nation. There are specifically 47 million Americans without health insurance, and the number is between 150 to 200,000 in the Kansas City metro area, including Johnson and Wyandotte counties. The fasting, fastest growing segment of the uninsured is made up of what I call the young immortals. They make about 75,000 a year, and they're in their 30s. Uh, they go bare. Uh, they think they can use that money uh, for other things and that accidents and other medical maladies will not befall them. Um, I, I know some of them are lucky and get by with it, but uh, sometimes they're not lucky. And I would point uh, out a statistic many of you may know that medical expenses are a leading cause of bankruptcies uh, for uh, individuals and families uh, throughout our nation. The challenge of mandating health insurance for everyone uh, really comes with the corollary question is, uh, where do we get the money to pay for that mandate? For example, uh, who pays for the indigent? How do we define uh, the, where to draw the line? Is it uh, people with 50,000 or less Income gets subsidized, those over don't. Is that fair or is it another number? Um, does the mandate apply to the individual or does it apply to the employer? Uh, if it's the employer who doesn't make enough money to do that, are we forcing them out of business? Um, is it uh, reasonable and fair to ask individuals to chip in part of the cost of health care? And what do we do th with those who choose not to? Again, I'm not giving you answers, I'm just talking about the issues of leadership facing uh, the Kansas legislature, the Missouri legislature, our people in Washington, D.C., our political candidates, and, and for that matter, all of us involved in health care. Question three, I would pay more for health insurance through payroll deductions or through higher taxes to make sure everyone has health insurance. How do you feel about that? If you'd say, if so, yeah, I'd do that, hold your hand up. Those who wouldn't, hold your hand up. Now, I get specific with dollars. Would you do that at 100 bucks per year? Hold your hand up. What if it's uh, 2,000 a year? Hold your hand up. What if it's whatever it takes? That's kind of where I want universal health coverage, but maybe somebody else ought to pay for it. It's where it starts to break down. Should everybody have some responsibility in paying for his or her health insurance? You like that? Yeah. The health insurance industry has a national reputation that ranks somewhere between uh, gun manufacturers and tobacco cigarette makers. Uh, one of the popular solutions is, well, let's just seize the profits of the health insurance companies and we'll use that money to pay for everybody. Uh, my company, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City, is uh, not investor owned. Uh, we make one and a half or two percent of revenue as a profit uh, each year, but it goes into a bank account right here in Kansas City. It doesn't go off to pay uh, shareholders dividends. In the years when we have losses, and there are many of them, uh, that reserve funds it. But since we were founded in 1938 by hospitals and physicians in this town, we have been able to accumulate a reserve, a net worth, if you will, of almost $500 million. Well, you're probably saying, gosh, that's a lot of money. That ought to be able to insure everybody. Well, the fact of the matter is, 
what doctors and hospitals do for our society today is expensive. $500,000 would pay half of one ambulance ride one way for every one of our 900,000 customers. And uh, it is just so easy to aim the blame to, and I'm not saying that you're doing that, but to, to look at, uh, uh, look for simplistic solutions to, to uh, uh, tackle some of these problems. And believe me, they are all complex and they all constitute leadership challenges for me and for you. Question four. People should be more responsible for their own health in making lifestyle decisions like smoking, drinking, drugs, weight management, exercise, seat belts, etc. People who fail to be responsible should pay more for their health care or not be covered for conditions they bring on themselves. How do you like that one? Yeah. I guess you know better than I do. Sometimes they can't help it, uh, but a lot of times people can help it. For those of you who are delivering direct care to people, you know of the obesity epidemic that is sweeping across our city and across our nation. Um, in the book that I have given you as you came in, uh, there are illustrations of this problem, uh, not only in our geographic area, but throughout the country. We had a speaker uh, last October at uh, the first health summit uh, that we sponsored. Uh, Steve Aldana is his name. He uh, spoke about the eating habits of uh, various parts of our geography and noted that we in Kansas City like our barbecue. We like to smoke a little more than the national average. And even though 40% of our population will likely be clinically obese by 2020, if you heard that, if current trends hold, uh, places like the southeast of the United States are even worse. He says in Alabama, they have come to look upon gravy as a beverage, uh, which I <laughs> said, hey, I know some guys down here that are kind of like that. The Cross Blue Shield pays out $2 billion a year to doctors and hospitals to take care of illness and injury for our 900,000 customers. Would it surprise you to know that half of that payout is for the treatment of illness and injury that is, at least in part, self-induced by bad lifestyle habits? Um, you know, I, th I think you know the sin list. Um, it, it includes uh, smoking, uh, drinking, drug abuse, uh, not exercising, uh, blah, blah, blah. Our prescription, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and we've got a program that's starting to have some effect in it called the Healthier You program, is to eat less, drink less, exercise more, quit smoking, and buckle up. Uh, I hope you will find some enjoyment and some use for the facts that are contained uh, in this, uh, I think, valuable book that looks not only at our nation, but at our community on a number of uh, critical health measures. Uh, it is not going to be possible for us to create the reforms that we all want unless we become more responsible for our own health. Leadership in health care reform is a challenge for me. I'm sure it is for Barbara and David and for Ed and others who struggle with these things all the time. Uh, I don't think there is going to be gain without pain. Uh, there will be tax pains, there will be convenience pains, and hopefully there will be the pain that comes with getting off the couch. Uh, it's my belief that our entire health care system is not broken and that we have an abundance of health care institutions and health care professionals who sometimes give half of their life training at outstanding institutions like this in order to go into the health care field and take care of our society. As the election approaches this November and the political debate heats up, there is little public support, at least in my mind, for what we call a single-payer system. That means Medicare for everybody administered by the federal government. They decide uh, what Bob Page gets paid at the hospital. They decide uh, what physicians get paid for services. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield dies and goes away, and uh, there is some government entity that will pay your claim, hopefully. you can sense a little bit of sarcasm in my voice there, so I, I'm, I'm not for that. I don't think the American public I, I is, 
But I, I, there are models in Great Britain, in Canada, in Germany, and other uh, areas where that model has been successful. Uh, most of them uh, have to balance the budget uh, with the demand for health care services for that nation that inevitably leads to some level of rationing. Uh, does everyone get a hip replacement or are there limits? Uh, does everyone get coronary bypass or are there limits? Uh, blah, 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 blah. You, you know the list as well as I do. And America, I think, will have more difficulty than many nations coming to grips with balancing dollars at, the, at a national level with the demand for services, particularly for people that are close to us. I think, as a result, most Americans want us to build on the existing system we have, try to correct its flaws, make it better, make it cover everyone, not throw it on the junk heap and, and hope that the federal government will come up with a better solution. In order for that to happen, we are all going to have to sacrifice, we are all going to have to change, and uh, I think that's pretty obvious. Let me conclude my formal remarks by saying to you that uh, I really have appreciated this opportunity to share a few tips from my leadership uh, journey, and I hope they're helpful to you. Uh, I want you to all remember uh, the importance and the honor of your profession and our industry. Uh, the health of our patients and the health of our community and our nation are noble goals worthy of the best that you can put forward every day and the best leadership that we can all muster. There is no more precious commodity in our lives than health, and I'd like to close with this proverb that always inspires me. It reads, he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. Thank you very much. I get to play Phil Donahue again. Any, uh, I'm sure there are questions. No, not yet. Okay, well. Um, we could spur a few on, I'll bet. Yes. Um, this is always the fun part of these. This has uh, certainly been a gradual, if not uh, heavy, shift onto, um, away from insurance carriers and onto individuals, which certainly has added pressure. <laughs> and that, that group you talk about, the 75,000 yes. salary that decide they can free float and take the risk. Um, how much longer do you see that going on? I, I, I got the message that it probably is going to get worse before it gets better in terms of shifting onto employees. It is. Uh, small businesses in Kansas City uh, used to be 60 to 70 percent of them provided health insurance to their employees. It's fallen below 50 percent now just because they can't afford it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about dry cleaners, restaurants, things like that, small businesses. <coughs> The policies we sell at La Crosse Blue Shield are getting to be <coughs> more and more cost sharing for the member. 70% uh, of the individual policies we sell have a $2,500 deductible or more. And that generates, you know, uh, uh, more of an obligation for doctors and hospitals to, to pick up part, uh, part of the bill when the service is delivered. Uh, the McKinsey Consulting Group came out with a study last year that uh, is stunning to me. It said that uh, doctors and hospitals across the nation are able to collect only 47% of the deductible coinsurance and copay amounts that uh, patients are responsible for. And I think that problem is growing. Uh, uh, Bob, another, uh, another example is of the problem getting bigger is we lose more customers each year to the ranks of the uninsured than we do to all of our competition combined. Um, and I worry that there is a growing sense in society that it's not my job to provide health insurance for myself or my family. It's someone else's job. Uh, we've got to find a way to work through that as an industry and as a society if we're going to, if we're going to turn things back to a, a more positive uh, course. Yes?
Uh, there's a couple of recent articles in the Kansas City Star about the difference in health care escalation costs. And I think in Missouri it was between 25 and 30 percent in the last 35, year. 35 over the last five or six. I saw the article. And it mentioned in the same period of time Kansas was 8 percent. It's, it's kind of difficult from reading those articles to really understand why there would be such a difference in two adjoining states. Could you comment on that? My recollection of the Star uh, article a couple days ago by Julius Karish was uh, uh, that it was focusing on the cost of health insurance nationally and the rate of increase over this five-year period of time compared to that of both Kansas and Missouri. I, I think the article said the rate of increase in health insurance premiums for these two states was a, just a tad higher than the national average. Uh, we, of course, insure uh, a third of our customer base in Johnson and Wyandotte County, and the other third is in Missouri. The costs uh, between the two are uh, nearly identical. I don't see any uh, difference in consumption uh, from Kansas residents than from Missouri residents. Uh, the cost for a hospitalization is uh, very similar to both. Um, I, I, I would say if the article said uh, that it was a lot cheaper in Kansas, uh, I, I don't think that's, that's an accurate statement from, from our perspective. The bigger point, though, is a, a policy this, uh, for family health insurance from our company today, 800 bucks a month, this is the total cost going up uh, 8 to 12 percent a year depending on the year. Some, some years it's 8, sometimes it's 12. And uh, individual policies around 300, again 8 to 12 percent increases per year. So how does the individual cope? How does the employer cope? Well the way they're coping, coping is bigger and bigger deductibles, more and more coinsurance, and the next thing our industry is trying to do is to make members more cost-conscious shoppers for health care services. Uh, the power of the consumer is considerable. I have my own personal doubts about some of my competitor companies who envision that uh, we're going to take the American population and turn them into Walmart shoppers for health care services. Uh, that they will get their coronary bar bypass at uh, KU instead of St. Luke's, how's that for a juicy example? Or they're going to get their gallbladder removed at Shawnee Mission instead of Olathe, or they're going to get, uh, uh, you, you name the service. Um, number one, you've got to be awake and not under anesthesia when you make some of these decisions, so that's number one problem with that. Uh, knowing and educating people what the costs are on average from an institution is going to be a challenge. The CPT codes for doctor services, there are about 10,000 things doctors do uh, for patients. And having a man or woman on the street understand uh, what it is, uh, it, it, I just, I don't have all that much faith in the Walmart shopper theory. I do have a lot of faith in, in uh, restructuring the way employers uh, offer health insurance to their employees in a way that encourages better health habits. If they smoke and won't go through smoking cessation, maybe they pay $10 a month more for health insurance. If they have another chronic condition and won't enroll in one of the uh, disease management programs that will help the patient and help the member, maybe they get to pay a little bit more for health insurance. I've got great hope that those things will work. Uh, feeling a little less uh, uh, confident about some of the other trends we have in our industry. I'll bet you all have trends uh, on the healthcare financing side, you know, it was, it, it's a rage a decade, and consumer driven health plans are the rage today. Other questions? I have one here. Mr. Bowser, with the growing need, with the growing development of underinsured and uninsured patients and people in this country, um, coupled with uh, decreased enrollment of physicians going into um, primary care, yeah. I'd like to understand what is your vision yeah. for advanced practice nurses being. Um, seen as primary care providers and being reimbursed accordingly? Very good question. Uh, the primary care physician specialties of family practice, general medicine, pediatrics, uh, internal medicine, uh, in terms of the pecking order on the pay scale, uh, are at the bottom. They've been at the bottom for a long, long time. I think one of the faults of the health 
healthcare financing industries is we pay a lot for cutting and poking. We don't pay very well for thinking. And uh, uh, that has a direct impact on the thinking specialties. And uh, we've tried to do a few things with that. Uh, pay for excellence programs, uh, which reward primary care physicians for uh, good customer service, good quality, those sorts of things. But to be honest with you, those are smallish uh, amounts uh, in terms of their impact. Uh, the way physicians are paid is heavily driven by the Medicare RBRVS table that assigns units, and I think we're going to need some uh, substantial changes there. But when, you know, the primary care boys and girls uh, go to AMA and say, up us, uh, the specialists are saying, I don't think so. With regard to uh, PAs, uh, ancillary providers, uh, uh, and, uh, and others, I think the uh, trend is definitely uh, positive for them. Uh, we are seeing in the Kansas City uh, pharmacies, uh, many meds of various different kinds with uh, physician assistants and other healthcare professionals taking care of minor uh, health care problems. Uh, customers are delighted with the convenience. Uh, they're delighted with the cost. And uh, uh, frankly, as, as I have great sympathy for primary care MDs and DOs, uh, it's hard to get into them sometimes. I mean, you're, you're sick and you call and, well, we can work you in next Thursday. Uh, that, that doesn't work so well. So they're going to have to uh, do some changing too. Future bright for for uh, physician assistants and others. Other questions? Yes. Well, the question is, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, healthcare financing was at least in theory, suppressed by tighter doctor and hospital networks and insurance plans, the use of capitation to pay for doctor and hospital services and other pretty uh, draconian measures. And the question is, do I see that coming back? Um, not really. Uh, the American public uh, does not like to get their health care from little shoebox networks. They want freedom of choice. And uh, if you go to a group of 100 or, or 10,000, some people would like the lower cost, but others want a better balance uh, with, with broad choice. For, and thank goodness that's what we uh, provide. I do think, though, that uh, uh, price of of services provided by physicians and hospitals could uh, uh, come under a new kind of pressure. The federal government and health plans are getting enormous pressure for something called transparency, for KU to be able to, KU hospital to be able to say, this is our average charge for coronary bypass and these are our outcomes uh, against some sort of standard measure. Um, and if somebody is double or triple the community average, uh, people may go to a different, in, and, and the quality measures are similar, they may go to a lower cost uh, institution, particularly as they pay more and more out of pocket. Uh, whether we like transparency or not, uh, it's coming, and I think we all have to work together to help the uh, American public and Kansas City public understand what a price means. I hate the approach being used, some of our competitors, who uh, take a doctor list and give four stars to the guy or gal that's the cheapest and, you know, one star to whoever may be most expensive because I don't think that indicates uh, what we ought to be looking at. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You know, the health care dollar from Blue Cross Blue Shield gets split up a little bit like this. Uh, about 43 to 45 percent of our total payout goes to hospitals. Of that 43 to 45 percent, half is for inpatient services, half for outpatient. That's changed a lot over the last 20 years. The outpatient was just a fraction a long, long time ago. Um, what we pay to physicians is about 22 percent 
of the healthcare dollar. Um, I struggle with that a little bit. Uh, here you have the men and women who are delivering the care, making the decision, and we pay so much more for the house in which they deliver it. Have we gotten off track there? Uh, but uh, I'm sure Bob Page wouldn't like that part of my speech, but <laughs> it does concern me. Uh, another comparison, again, physicians 22% of our payout compared to pharmacy costs, what we pay for, uh, for the wonderful pharmaceuticals we have. Uh, we pay almost 19% of, uh, of the health care dollar for prescriptions. And who can argue with the wonderful things that are happening from our ph pharmaceutical industry, uh, including uh, ex uh, saving lives and extending lives and doing other terrific things. Uh, but I do worry that uh, the engine of our health care system, uh, our physician seems to be less and less proportionally reversed, uh, reimbursed for uh, all the, the great skill they bring to the table. Well, you're probably saying, when's he going to tell how much insurance companies take out of it? So, Popular opinion is 50% of the health care premium goes to the insurance company and they spend half of it on administration and half of it on, on profit. Uh, my company, Blue Cross Blue Shield, takes about 14% uh, for administration. That is to sell, to pay claims, to pay the brokers, uh, to pay the employees, uh, rent, light, uh, those sorts of things. Again, no dividends to shareholders. Um, profit, I mentioned earlier, one, two, three percent a year. Sometimes we have losses. That's a lot different than the public uh, looks at it. However, we can and need to do better than that. And uh, I know we irritate and agitate a lot of people uh, with claims because they are complex sorts of things. But that's kind of a snapshot of where the health care dollar goes today and I uh, thought you might find that interesting. I have Other? a question over here. Um, some insurance companies will cover gym memberships and even purchasing um, fruits and vegetables. Do you feel that insurance companies are doing enough of that to promote wellness? Uh, no. And we need to do more. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I think we need to rework with employers and individual policyholders to realign what we charge to reward people that engage in good health practices and, frankly, uh, make them pay more if they're, they're not doing the things that they ought to do. Um, with specific reference to gym memberships, um, um, one experience uh, in our industry is those who use them are those who are in shape and uh, uh, probably are not going to bring the health care bill down any, uh, but maybe we need to rethink that. Uh, there are a few health plans that do that, and I, I kind of like the, the approach that's uh, being used. You know, uh, here's a membership fee of X. If you use it eight times a month, the company will pay half. Uh, if you don't use it uh, with that kind of frequency, whatever it might be, uh, it could fall to zero. That's a, uh, I think if all this is going to work, we, we all have to have uh, better health habits and a gym uh, uh, and a health facility can, can be an important part of that. Other questions from anyone? You know, I live out in uh, Cedar Creek, which is uh, the way out west, you know, toward Lawrence. And uh, I look at the hospital. I'm, st I'm going back to the empty center of our audience here and my comparison to how hospitals are located. But uh, at K7 and K10, out where I live, there are at least five or six hospitals who have announced plans to build hospitals. And I say to all of them, hey guys, we were just hoping for a grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, a confounding and uh, troubling uh, thing that uh, there are so many people unable to pay in the central city that hospitals must go to the suburbs or at least put a stake in the ground uh, to have access to those. But I just think of the bricks and mortar expense that goes with it. It's not unique to Kansas City. It's happening everywhere. One of the many challenges uh, we have, I'll wrap up by congratulating each of you for the wonderful job you do in educating physicians for our community. Uh, 
physical therapists, pharmacists, nurses, uh, all of the professions represented by the Allied uh, School of Health. Uh, the Med Center and the hospital are uh, uh, organizations that I'm proud to be hanging out with and uh, uh, working with to tackle some of the problems we talk, talked about today. Thank you very much.